Um, right, so the rough kind of schedule for uh, what's going to happen now is that we're going to have, um, first there'll be a talk from Howard Wilson, who's going to give us an introduction to kind of some fusion stuff and the roadmap towards it. Um, then from around 1.30 to uh, 1.40, we'll have a talk from Anika Khan, who's going to speak to us about materials for fusion. And then from uh, 1.40 until about 10 past two, we'll have a talk from Nick Osborne, who's going to talk us through some of FuseNet's um, educational materials. Um, after this point, that's when you kind of have a break and leave and go to the webinar at half two. And then after the webinar, there'll be a, a question and answer session back in this Zoom meeting um, at 35 past three. Um, where you can have ask any questions that you have uh, from today. So that's kind of the rough uh, outline of things. Um, Nick has said that he's not going to be at the Q&A session, so any questions you have about the uh, FuseNet educational materials, um, you can potentially ask at the end of this session. Um, it might just eat a little bit into the 15-minute the break between this and the webinar. Okay. Right. Um, so I've got to, if everyone's okay with it, they've asked that we take a group photo. So could I ask people to turn their webcams on so I can do a group photo and then you can turn it off for the rest of the talk. If you don't want to, that's fine. Just uh, let me know that you're not doing it. Okay, right, so um, I'm gonna do the photo then. Um, okay. Okay, that should all be done. If you want, you can now turn your webcam back off. Um, okay, so uh, if you uh, think of probably what we're going to get for people joining. We can uh, start with the talk soon. So our first talk is going to be from Professor Howard Wilson. He's the uh, director of the Fusion uh, Centre for Doctoral Training, which is a collaboration between uh, five uh, UK universities uh, training the next kind of generation of fusion scientists, which I'm a student in. Um, he's also a UK um, Atomic Energy Authority's director of the STEP project, which I think he's going to tell you a bit more about in his talk. Um, so yeah, he's going to kind of give us an introduction to fusion and describe some potential pathways towards achieving generation of electricity via fusion power. So if you are ready to begin, Howard. Okay. Or you can wait a bit longer if you want. Uh, we might as well crack on, mightn't we? Yeah. Uh, okay, so thank you very much. Just a quick correction, I was the, the, the UK AEA step director. I stepped down from that position oh, uh, sorry. at the end of May. Uh, there's a new director now in post. Um, but it's certainly true that I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. Um, so if I can just find my slides and share them. Okay, so 20 minutes isn't very long to tell you about uh, fusion energy from the start to the to where we are now. Um, so I'm going to be rattling through fairly quickly, but uh, uh, as Lucy said, we have a question and answer session later this afternoon and uh, try and clarify some of the things uh, later. This talk is very much from a UK perspective. Fusion energy is an international endeavour, strong international collaborations, and UK is a, uh, um, a, a strong partner in those collaborations. Uh, and so what I'm giving you is a, a UK perspective of that fusion energy program. Uh, this is the outline of the talk. Uh, I'll start by just introducing what the, the basic science is, the fusion reaction that we're trying to exploit to deliver energy. Look at the benefits of delivering energy this way uh, and a quick discussion of, uh, of the tokamak approach to uh, uh, realizing fusion energy. There's a number of different ways, different, different approaches. The most advanced is the tokamak and that's what I'm going to focus on. Uh, we'll then look at the pathways to fusion. How do we go from where we are now to realizing a commercial fusion reactor delivering electricity to the grid? Uh, that will lead us into how do we train the generation who is going to achieve that? And I'll close with a summary. So science first. 
This is the basic reaction that we're trying to exploit. So hopefully you can see my cursor. Uh, we use two isotopes of hydrogen, so two heavy, heavy forms of hydrogen, one called deuterium, one called tritium. And if we can bring those, the nuclei of those um, uh, atoms sufficiently close together, they will join, fuse, and create helium, uh, a benign product, actually a very useful product, uh, and a, a neutron, and lots of energy, lots of mass, uh, uh, sorry, uh, lots of power. Uh, if you weigh your neutron and your helium and you weigh your deuterium and tritium, you find that your, your neutron and your helium weigh slightly less than your deuterium and tritium did. And that missing mass has been converted into power, uh, as Einstein said it should, with E equals mc squared. These sound very exotic fuels, deuterium and tritium, but actually deuterium is plentiful. Uh, they're hydrogen-like uh, in, in terms of their chemistry. Um, and in fact, one in every 6,000 hydrogens is in fact a deuterium. So if you think about all the hydrogen that is in the world through the H2O, through the water in the sea, for example, it's, it, it's abundant. So deuterium as a fuel is plentiful and we can harvest that from the, uh, from the environment. Tritium, however, is very rare uh, and therefore we have to manufacture it on site. And the way we do that is to take this neutron that comes out of the reaction and react it with a uh, with a with an element called lithium. Actually, it will be in some sort of compound, typically oxides or, or whatever. But the lithium is, uh, nucleus is what we're interested in. And we react that neutron with the lithium and that produces tritium, which we can then react with the deuterium uh, to get, uh, and it also gives us a bit more helium and in fact, a bit more power. And so we, we have this sort of cyclic reaction where we are constantly replenishing the fuel that we're burning up by introducing lithium into the system. Uh, lithium sounds exotic, but it's a, uh, it's again it's abundant. Uh, it's the, it's uh, the, the the basic uh, element in many rechargeable batteries, for example. Um, for example, the rechargeable battery, uh, the rechargeable battery in this laptop that I'm using now. Uh, an interesting fact is if you take the deuterium that's in half a bath full of seawater and the lithium that's in one one um, uh, laptop battery, you see there the basic fuels for our fusion project, uh, for our fusion process. If you take those, that will give you all your lifetimes electricity needs. So you can see that really there's an abundant supply of fuel uh, as an individual. We have to contain this. So we have to contain our fuel, our tritium and our deuterium uh, and our lithium uh, and our neutron. We'll see in a moment, we have to bring these to very, very high temperatures. And in that high temperature, um, uh, situation um, uh, they're in plasma form uh, and so they have to be contained in the plasma that creates the hot core of the reactor and then around that plasma we, we um, uh, assemble the lithium lithium compounds in, a, in blankets that surround the plasma to capture the neutrons that come flying out uh, and then this goes to products the main product we have in mind is electricity but actually there are other products that we can use either using the neutron or using the uh, the heat directly in uh, industrial processes rather than converting it to electricity uh, but for electricity it's a standard process of converting the, uh, the heat to boil water steam turbines drive the electricity so that's the basic uh, principle behind providing the electricity and first of all you'll notice that there were no carbon dioxide emissions so there's no contribution to greenhouse gases it provides a base load supply you can switch it on and off when you like uh, and so it's a good base load supply of electricity you don't have to wait for the environmental conditions to be right abundant fuel as i've already said and it's safe and it is safe because the real drawback of fusion is incredibly difficult to achieve and if anything goes wrong it just switches itself off so it's inherently uh, a, safe, um, uh, a safe process. So very attractive, but it's hard. Why is it hard? Well, the basic problem is we have to take this deuterium and this tritium nuclei, both of which are positively charged, and we have to bring them sufficiently close together that they will fuse. And the way, and of course, they don't want to come together because they're both positively charged, so they repel. One way to get them to come together sufficiently close is to heat them to really high temperatures so they're going really fast and they can overcome this Coulomb repulsion. And if you look at the kind of temperatures that you need for deuterium and tritium, it's about 100 million degrees centigrade or Kelvin, doesn't matter which. Uh, and that's about 10 times the temperature of the center of the, uh, of the center of the sun. So this is pretty extreme, but that's not the only issue. And in fact, we can do that as, you, as we'll see in a moment. When you heat anything to those sorts of temperatures, they convert to a new, new state called a plasma. And I've already mentioned a plasma um, uh, in the previous slide. So what is a plasma? Well, plasma is, is if you imagine starting with ice, the solid state of water, uh, heat that, it becomes 
liquid water, heat that, it becomes the gaseous steam, heat that and your molecules dissociate to the atoms, but keep heating and your electrons effectively boil off the nuclei. And so you get a state where the overall system is still neutral because you haven't created or lost any net charge, but you have a, an equal amount of positive and negative charge. The particles are now all charged and so react with each other in a different way to neutral particles, but the overall thing is neutral. And that state, because it has different physics processes to a neutral gas, is given a new, new state of matter, and that's called a plasma. So we have this soup of negatively charged electrons and positively charged ions in this plasma state. So how do you hold this thing at 100 million degrees long enough for the fusion to occur? And there's basically two principles. One is magnetic confinement, and that, that I'll talk about uh, in more detail uh, this afternoon. And the other one is inertial confinement, which I'm not going to talk about, um, but I can discuss more in the uh, questions and answers this afternoon if people have want to know a little bit more about it. So magnetic confinement, it is the more advanced approach at the moment. And in particular, the tokamak is the most advanced uh, of the magnetic confinement uh, devices. This is a very special tokamak because this tokamak uh, is currently being built in the south of France uh, with seven international partners, of which Europe is one of the international partners, of which UK is a partner within Europe, within ETA. Uh, and so the UK is directly involved in the, in the ETA pro, uh, uh, programme and very important part. And ETA is a tokamak that will deliver 500 megawatts of fusion power. You can see it's a very expensive tokamak at over 15 billion euros of investment, but this is the first time we've built one of these. Uh, they're very complex uh, uh, beasts. So what are the basic elements of a tokamak? Well, in the center, in a donut shape is the plasma, this pink thing here, you can see it on one side, but it would go through this side of the chamber as well. So donut shaped plasma. So that is our deuterium and our tritium fuel. It's held because the particles are charged, they see magnetic field lines, they've experienced a force of magnetic field lines. So it's held in place by a magnetic field. And that magnetic field is produced by these big D-shaped coils here. So you see these, these orange coils here going all the way around and there's a, there's a number of them. I forget exactly how many you, uh, in ETA, but of the order of 16 or so of these D-shaped coils, give you the basic confining magnetic field. That's not quite enough for the magnetic field, it turns out. So you also have to induce a current in the plasma and that current gives you another component of the magnetic field that goes around this way, the so-called poloidal component of the magnetic field. And that current is induced in the plasma by a solenoid, this green solenoid that's wrapped around this, the, the center of the plasma here. And by ramping the current in the solenoid, you induce a magnetic field up through the center and through Faraday's law, you induce uh, a current in the plasma. So there's some good A-level physics associated with, uh, with tokamak plasmas. Finally, you see this is a D-shape a D-shaped vessel and a D-shaped plasma that fits in there. That shaping is created by these so-called poloidal field coils. So these are also current carrying coils, creating another magnetic field that sort of circle around the, the, the back of here. If you look down on top of the tokamak, you'd see them as circular coils. These are the poloidal field coils. So those, that gives you your basic confinement system. Now come over to the, to the right-hand side. We have ports here, and those ports uh, give access to the plasma from outside for diagnostic instruments and for heating and fueling the plasma. We have a set of wall materials that Anika will tell you a bit more about later, these tiles. Uh, these tiles are in an extreme environment. They see a lot of uh, heat from the light, the photons uh, that come out of the plasma, radiated from the plasma, and also those neutrons uh, can do a lot of damage to the materials. We have to breed the tritium, and so there are breeding blanket modules. On each of these will just be test breeding blanket modules. They won't actually generate tritium that will go into the reactor. They're just testing the, the elements of the, the breeding blanket modules, and they sit around the edge of the plasma. And then finally, all the heat and particles that, you go in, that go into the plasma to keep it hot have to come out and be exhausted somewhere, and they're exhausted in a very high um, heat handling capability of a, of a diverter, which will be tungsten on ETA. Right, so that's the basic uh, approach. How do we get there? Um, so before we ask how we get there, let's, let's, let's look at where we have to get to and how do we measure where we get to? Well, I've already said we have to achieve temperatures of 100, 100 million degrees. Um, plasma physicists use this measure of, um, uh, measure of, um, uh, of temperature. It's, it's around the energy of the particles, the thermal energy of the, of the, of the, of the um, plasma, uh, but it's directly proportional to temperature going along here from 0.1, 1, 10, 100 kV, kilo electron volts. If you want to get a feel for where, what those are, this is where the sun sits. So this is, uh, this is around 10 million degrees centigrade at this point here. And so here, up here, we have our 100 million degrees centigrade. 
up this uh, axis, we have what's called the triple product because it's the product of three things, the temperature of the plasma, the density of the plasma, and how well the magnetic field can combine that plasma in the so-called confinement time. So it's the time taken for half the energy to leak out of the plasma through the magnetic field. And that triple product turns out to be key. And if we can get that triple product high enough, we get a certain value of this, this thing that's called big Q, capital Q. And capital Q is the ratio of the fusion power that comes out to the power that we have to put in to achieve the conditions that require for fusion reactions. Now, if this triple product is not high enough, so if we're down here, we have a Q of 0.1, and that means that only 10% of what we put in as heating power comes out as fusion power, a pretty poor commercial prospect. You want a lot more fusion power to come out than power you have to put in to heat the plasma. Q of one is break even, so this is where you're putting the same amount of power in as comes out of the plasma and fusion, uh, and fusion energy. And then finally ignition up here, where you don't need to put any power in, the, the reaction will be self-contained through that helium actually that's produced in the fusion reaction. So the fusion react process keeps the plasma hot itself and you don't need to apply any heat at all up here. And this is where we need to operate our, our commercial fusion reactors. So where are we? This is where we were. This was the first Tokamak T3 designed by the Russians uh, uh, in the 60s. It sat down here. Notice this scale is logarithmic. So it's a factor 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000 of where we needed to be back in the, in the 60s. And it's a factor of 10, 100 less than the temperature. Notice there is an optimum temperature and that's why we're saying we're aiming for 100 million degrees. We're not aiming to just get as high as possible because it makes it harder in this thing if we go up to higher temperature. You see these curves going up here. So we're aiming to sit here and we were a factor of 100 low. But this was really exciting at the time. This was the best performing machine that we, that we had in the world. Uh, and so the rest of the world went out and mimicked it, built slightly big ones, bigger ones. So Aztecs was, was in Germany, PLT was in the US, TFR I think was in France, T10 was the, an upgrade to this in Russia, uh, etc. And immediately you see you get a factor of 10 increase in the triple product and the temperature through the 70s and 80s. In the 80s and 90s, we start to see tokamaks that are still operating today. Jets in the UK, for example, D3D in the US, for example, Aztecs Upgrade in Germany, for example. Uh, so these are, these are including tokamaks now that still operate in the 80s and 90s. Notice we're now hitting the temperatures. Our plasmas are getting to 100 million degrees. That's pretty cool. That's pretty hot. But also, we're now starting to get up to reasonable values of triple products. Now, still a factor of 100 where we, where we need to be. Then we just got cleverer and cleverer at being able to control our plasmas with the magnetic field through the 1990s. And so by the end of the 1990s, turn of the century, makes me sound old, uh, we're knocking on the door of Q equals one. We're knocking on the door of break even. To go beyond this, we think we have to go bigger than jet, bigger than, bigger, uh, bigger than our biggest machine at the moment. And that is where ETA sits. And that kind of guides where ETA will sit. So ETA is designed to produce 10 times more fusion energy than his, than, his, uh, than his input to the plasma to keep it hot. It will start operating in 2025. This is the site back in May, I think it was. Uh, and this is where you see it's a huge site. So if you look at, I don't know, you probably see some vehicle. There's a little car down there, look. So that gives you an idea of the size of the scale of the site. This is where the reactor will sit. So it's not all about the tokamak. There's a whole load of other infrastructure that's needed. But this is where the tokamak will sit in, in here. So that's the, the heart of the site, if you like. So this is really exciting. We're going to see this machine operating uh, in the next five or six years. That is a key part. ITER is a key part of the European roadmap to fusion. And in fact, it's a key part of, uh, of uh, most of the country's um, uh, national strategies towards fusion. So this top line, so this is the roadmap, the Eurofusion roadmap to fusion, the European roadmap to fusion. This is ITER, uh, produced first plasma around 2025. Uh, is when first plasma comes on, but it doesn't put full deuterium tritium in until 2035 uh, up here. Um, at the same time, we're starting to design the machine that will come after ITA demo. This will start to demonstrate the commercial viability of fusion. Materials research is really important. It's going on along the line, uh, along uh, in parallel, and there'll be a machine called IFMIF Donors dedicated to materials testing because ITA won't produce enough neutrons to test materials in a neutron environment. And Anika will tell you a bit more about that. The UK, in the meantime, is pursuing this and we're active partners in this strategy and we're strong believers in this strategy but in parallel we're saying can we bring this thought can we bring this time this demo time earlier can we bring it in particular to 2040 
um, uh, given the urgency of climate change. And at the same time, try and build a reduced size device. We've seen how big ETA was. Actually, you didn't because I didn't point out to you the little person that was standing there. If you want to get a scale of the size, of that, that's a person standing there. So it's a big device. Uh, demo at the moment is designed to be bigger still. Our question is, can we build it smaller, cheaper and faster? And this is the aim of something called the STEP programme the, for the UK, the Spherical Tokamak for Energy Production. Spherical Tokamak, as the name suggests, is a tokamak, but it's a more compact version of a tokamak with a smaller hole in the middle. Uh, the plasma is more like a cord apple than a ring donut, if you want to think of it in that way. And it's that compact nature which we anticipate will reduce the cost, but also it has a pl attractive plasma physics uh, and maintenance um, uh, um, characteristics as well. This is how we see step fitting on um, amongst the, uh, uh, the European um, uh, uh, roadmap. Um, so this is now a, a UK um, pathway map, if you like. These, these here are all UK facilities. We have a remote maintenance facility at UKAA in, in Cullum uh, for developing the remote maintenance um, capability for, um, uh, for uh, fusion reactors. We have a materials research facility uh, at UKAA. We have tritium handling facilities at UKAA and we have a whole bunch of fusion technologies uh, looking at how one develops things like the breeding blanket to withstand the hostile environment of a fusion reactor. And integrating all these together, we have a high performance computing capability through the National Archer, um, uh, and Archer 2 uh, com supercomputers, for example. So this gives us a good, good grounding to look at all those different aspects associated with a fusion reactor. In addition, we later this year, in December this year, Mast U, our own spherical tokamak, our UK spherical tokamak, which is part of the European program, um, but it's owned by the UK, uh, will start operating. And you can see the plasma will sit in here and you see how thin this, this central region is. And that's what brings the whole thing down in size. We, the UK, also operate JETS, which is still the flagship tokamak, tokamak anywhere in the world until ETA starts operating. Um, and we operate JET for the European community. This is a European facility, not a UK facility, but the UK operates it. So we have good operational uh, experience of, a, uh, of an integrated tokamak um, uh, facility. And then JT60SA is a collaboration between ourselves in Europe and Japan um, uh, as part of the so-called ETA broader approach. It's being built in Japan but with a lot of European input and it will have European exploitation that we're very interested in. Already mentioned ETA, already mentioned if, if donors, already mentioned demo, already mentioned how we get to a fusion power plant and we imagine STEP will fit in here. And so it will be a demo itself, it will be a demonstration device itself, but we're looking to bring it forward closer to, um, uh, to ETA uh, and if they've done this. As you go up through here, the time, if you like, time is going up vertically here. From R&D design, which is what these facilities are about, to industrialization, which is what ETA is about. It brings billions of, billions of pounds, billions of euros uh, to um, industry in, in Europe and to commercialization. And the commercialization is when industry takes over and starts to build the, the fusion reactors. Uh, this is just another way of saying uh, of saying the same thing about step, but part, but it's a, a key part part of step is not just to build not just design a reactor but design that reactor in collaboration with industry. So we have the national lab, UK Atomic Energy Authority. We have industry, important so that they can build their skills and, and establish the skills because they're going to have to build fusion reactors eventually, but also to inform the design of step to make sure that it's um, uh, manufacturable. Uh, and also universities, both for fundamental research uh, and also optimize it, uh, uh, to optimise the design and also, for, importantly, for training the next generation. Which brings me to my last point uh, of, um, uh, of education. Uh, a really important point that I want to make is it all starts at school. Um, I mean, uh, uh, the, the te teachers are, are the ones that first inspire um, um, young people, students, kids, um, to get excited about the world around them in so many different ways. And so we rely very heavily on, uh, uh, on teachers to um, uh, promote the, um, uh, uh, the benefits of, um, uh, of various careers and therefore the education that, that those, uh, those kids need. And what is really important is to make sure that all children from all backgrounds, all ethnic backgrounds, uh, all genders, um, realise that fusion is a place that they can contribute to, that they are welcome to uh, um, participate in. This is really important. This is where uh, minds are made up, is, is when the kids are at school. We then have two higher level training schemes. One is apprenticeships, where students are embedded with um, 
uh, with industry typically uh, and develop the skills in partnership with industry and then the more traditional academic routes either through a master's programs and we operate an MSc in fusion energy at, at York for example uh, and doctoral programs. This figure down here just shows all the universities that are now involved in the fusion program uh, in the UK. If I'd shown this five or six years ago there would have been maybe four or five universities. This shows the, the rapid pace that, that fusion is um, growing in the UK. We were in something quite innovative in, uh, in the UK. It's called the Fusion Centre for Doctoral Training. It's one of something like 50 to 60 centres for doctoral training that uh, uh, the EPSRC, the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council within UKRI, um, uh, fund. Uh, so ours um, is focused on fusion energy. We're a network of five universities led by York, but also involving Durham, Liverpool, Manchester, where Anika is, and Oxford. And this was Anika a few years ago when she was a student at the Fusion CDT um, uh, in part of the top, the top program. It's a four year program. It integrates um, top, uh, top program with the research. We collaborate with international laboratories, including in the UK, such as uh, UKA, AWE, Rutherford Appleton Laboratory. Also, international volunteers like ETA, like Fusion for Energy, FuseNet, of course, um, Rutherford, uh, um, and uh, this is the Korean Fusion uh, Institute, but also industry, uh, and that includes private fusion companies, uh, which are, of which there are a growing number of, of significant importance in the UK. And our aim is to generate, is to train the fusion generation, those who will work on ETA and the international laser facilities. This is around the inertial fusion that I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, those that will design, build, and then operate STEP. Uh, those that will support the private fusion endeavors in this country and abroad. Uh, those that will design and optimize the first generation of commercial uh, uh, power stations. So there's some really exciting careers for uh, people getting involved in fusion now. Um, but also the skills they develop are very relevant for a range of um, related industries from fission to plasma technology, et cetera. And we see about half of our students go into those related industries. So it's a four year PhD, but it does much more than just do a PhD training. This shows the topics that we cover. We cover material science, we cover the plasma science, mainly tokamaks, we cover laser plasma science for inertial fusion, control and instrumentation, and increasingly social sciences, which is gonna become increasingly important as we start to build fusion reactors um, uh, in the community. That part of, part of how we speak to the community is done through outreach and our students are incredibly active at outreach from going to schools through the Sun Dome to uh, a, a very active podcast uh, to videos that they produce as well. And these are really important for uh, communicating fusion and the work of the CDT to the wider community. So that's me, I'm a minute over, I do apologize. Uh, I'll just um, uh, leave that summary up. It doesn't say anything new that I haven't said. Okay, thank you. Thank okay. you very much for that. Um, it was very interesting. So uh, once the summary slide has, everyone's read it, our next talk is uh, from Dr. Anika Khan, who, uh, as we've already said, was a previous student on the CDT, but is now a research fellow at the University of Manchester, um, working on a kind of material science uh, specifically to do with uh, nuclear fusion. So she's going to talk to us about Kind of material requirements and materials in fusion reactors. Sorry, I just had to unmute myself. I realised I was muted. Thank you very much for the introduction and thanks, Howard, as well for the previous talk. Um, as Lucy mentioned, I'm at the University of Manchester and I'm a research fellow in materials for nuclear fusion. So, just a bit of a recap, as Howard mentioned. Uh, on Earth, the most efficient fusion reaction for commercial, commercial energy production will be the reaction between deuterium and tritium. Um, and that's just because it has a, a higher cross-section uh, compared to fusion reactions with a, within a similar um, energy range. I'm also going to talk a little bit about ITER, which Howard also mentioned, um, partly because I used to work there. And it's a really cool place. Uh, obviously, now we can't visit there, but they have a lot of um, resources available where you can do like virtual tours and stuff like that so I highly recommend um, you check out the, the ETA website and it's really awe-inspiring and it's it's such a exciting example of collaboration between scientists from all over the world working together to achieve um, one goal. Um, again just for a bit of a scale of, of the tokamak which I would mention uh, so this is the, the ETA tokamak you can see that it's about 30 meters uh, like all the components together in, in 
um, diameter and then the scale there's a little person there at the bottom so you can see it's, pre it's pretty massive and it's very awe-inspiring when you go and visit uh, and I do recommend when people can travel again to go and visit because they often offer tours that the general public um, can go on uh, so it's really impressive. Now onto the topic of my talk which will be materials issues uh, for fusion reactors. So this slide will just summarise uh, what each of the issues are um, and then I'll go into a bit more detail. So the first issue is from that DT reaction we get 14 MeV neutrons produced. Obviously that's very high energy neutrons and they have very specific types of damage that they will induce in different materials. Then there's very high heat loads, um, which I'll talk about a bit later on as well. Um, another thing that we need to think about in fusion is that we don't want the materials we use to have high activation levels. We don't want to create a lot of waste or radioactive waste from fusion reactors. That's one of the big selling points of fusion reactors that unlike fission, which has very high levels of radioactive waste after operation, we don't want that to be the case for fusion reactors. So that limits the kind of choice of materials that we have. Another thing is that within the plasma, you have helium, which causes very specific um, damage in the materials that we're using as well. Then just general plasma damage uh, with the interface between the wall and the plasma that, that causes a lot of damage as well. And then in order to contain the fusion reaction, we need really high magnetic fields. So there's also research that's starting to be carried out on the influence of the, the magnetic fields on material performance as well. Now I'll go into a bit more detail into all of these different um, aspects of materials issues for a fusion reactor. So if I start with the 14 MeV neutrons. Um, so when a neutron will you know, hit the material, it'll cause displacements in the material, uh, kind of like a snooker ball, hitting other snooker balls uh, that you get different damage cascades. Um, and the damage induced varies across different length scales and time scales. Uh, so they're kind of shown in this diagram here in the top right corner. Um, and there's a lot of research being done across all of the time scales and length scales. Um, obviously we can't, we don't have like a fully functioning commercial fusion reactor at the moment where we can test all of these materials. So a lot of the time we have to focus on the smaller length scales and smaller time scales and then extrapolate uh, to, the, to the larger ones. And that can be a big challenge, um, but that's a key area of research that's going on with material science researchers and uh, engineering researchers at the moment as well. As I mentioned, there's high heat loads. So this kind of puts everything into perspective. Uh, so if we look at, you know, a Rolls-Royce uh, Trent engine, uh, HWR reactor, re-entry vehicle, these all experience pretty high heat loads. I think that's you know, easy to, to understand. So one area of the tokamak, which is called the diverter, which is essentially just kind of like an exhaust um, for the tokamak, which will kind of experience the highest heat loads. Um, during steady state, that's already similar to you know, a re-entry vehicle. So really extreme environments. And then uh, during the operation of ETA, we'll have events called transients, which are kind of like instabilities where you'll have really intense heat loads for short periods, uh, very short periods. But nevertheless, that's like 2000 megawatts per, per meter squared. Uh, so just that's kind of mind blowing um, when you think about the, the, the intense uh, heat loads there. So as I mentioned, we need to have reduced activation materials. So these are some kind of simulations that have been done uh, recently, which highlight, um, you know, in a demonstration fusion reactor, what kind of activation you'd get uh, one year down the line or, uh, or how long it would take for it to, to reach uh, low level waste where it's not high activation. So it kind of, all the orange ones basically are materials we can't use. So that severely limits uh, a huge amount of materials. But obviously that depends where in the reactor you are. So in some areas, so in the plasma phasing components, you have the highest neutron loads, you have a much uh, more limited uh, range of materials you can use. But for structural materials that are further away from the neutrons, have more shielding, that kind of increases the amount of materials available uh, for, further away from, from the neutrons. Then I mentioned helium exposure. So we'll have helium within the reactor, which can cause all sorts of crazy surface modifications. Uh, it can change thermal properties, mechanical properties, the amount of fuel retention. So, you know, we're using tritium. Tritium is quite rare, 
I know we want to try and uh, produce it in, in ESA using the breeding uh, blanket modules, um, but A, because it's rare, we don't want to waste it, and B, for safety regulations and safety reasons, we don't want to have tritium being, uh, you know, kept in all different parts of the reactor that we don't have control over, so we need to take, keep a high control of the inventory. Um, so it's really important to understand how the exposure to helium can influence all these different uh, topics. And this varies as well with the temperatures uh, of the exposures and the temperatures of operation. So this is like a picture of some tungsten here. Um, so when uh, tungsten is exposed to helium, it gets this really cool surface modification, um, which is called fuzz. Uh, and it's super awesome. It makes the material turn completely black. Uh, and completely changes the, the properties and it's like little nanotendrils. Um, so although that could be an issue during the operation of the fusion reactor, there's actually other spin-offs that could be, uh, that material could be used for. So sometimes one man's problem is another man's uh, solution. So I think that's it's quite interesting as well. Um, then if I talk about the plasma, uh, so plasma can cause a huge variety of damage such as erosion, deposition, dust, fuel retention, bubbles, blisters, embrittlement, and these are all kind of things we need to understand as material scientists and engineers. Uh, so we know that our materials can survive and do their jobs that they need to within a fusion reactor. Uh, and then the last one which I mentioned was magnetic fields. So the materials required for superconducting magnets to generate uh, a strong enough magnetic field, that's a huge area of research at the moment. And I don't know if any of you have seen the recent article, I think there was one in the New York Times, but in quite a bit of different uh, news about the Spark Reactor at MIT. So they're making use of really advanced superconducting um, materials and technology. So this is a key area of research for fusion materials that's very current and very exciting. Um, and again, just as a bit of perspective, at the centre of the eta central solenoid, the magnetic field has an intensity of 13 tesla. And if you can compare that to a PET scanner, which is typically only 1.5 tesla, there's a huge, huge uh, difference. So we need to also, you know, not only what materials do we use to make these magnets, but also what is the impact of those magnetic fields on the materials we're using? Those are the kind of two things we need to think about. So my final slide um, is just to kind of highlight what materials are used in ETA and where. Um, so we have the cryostat, which will be made of, of a stainless steel. Um, and then we have the vacuum vessel, which will also be made of, of stainless steel. And that's kind of like the first line of defense um, of the reactor. Then, as I mentioned, the diverter earlier, which will experience the highest heat load uh, here. This will be made of, of tungsten because it's got the highest melting point of, of any material or any metal, sorry, I should say. Then we've got a beryllium uh, blanket that's going to be used in this first wall area. And then we've got the superconducting magnets, which I've mentioned, uh, which will probably be made of uh, niobium tin or niobium titanium. And one thing I should mention is that these superconducting magnets are super cooled. So essentially, at the edge where those magnets are, that's almost absolute zero. And as Howard mentioned, in the center of the plasma, the temperature is around 100 million degrees, if not higher. And Nowhere else in the universe can I think of a, of a place where there's such a temperature gradient within the space of a few meters, you go from absolute zero, almost a bit warmer, uh, to 100 odd million degrees. Uh, so I think that's kind of mind boggling and highlights the real material challenges that we have such a varied environment and a lot of challenges to deal with. But I think it also makes it very exciting and very interesting uh, for people in the, in the fusion community. With that, I realised I've gone a bit over, so I will stop talking and hand it back uh, to Lucy. That was great, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so our next talk and our final talk of the day is from Nick Osborne. Um, he recently completed an MSc in fusion energy at York, like Howard was talking about earlier, and is now starting a PhD as part of the CDT um, with the University of Liverpool. Um, and is a new member of the FuseNet Student Council. Uh, before returning to physics, studying his MSc, he was actually a secondary school teacher in the UK for a number of years. He has lots of experience in teaching and fusion science. So he's going to be introducing the educational materials that FuseNet have been working on for potential use in schools. Hi. Right, hopefully, oh, is that working? The, am I showing the right screen there? 
Yeah, that's good. Great, thank you. Uh, great, okay. That's one second while I get my PowerPoint there. Uh, great, okay, thanks. Um, thanks very much for uh, that introduction, Lucy. Yes, so as Lucy said, I'm, I'm a student really of Fusion, um, uh, but I've been a teacher, so I'm a mature student who's been lucky to come back to studying. And um, so it's been very, very nice for me, but I have worked as a physics teacher um, for many years before that. So I'm a sort of half expert on fusion, <laughs> unlike the Lee Howard, but, uh, but I, I'm sort of learning. But um, anyway, now that you've seen those uh, rather uh, very interesting introductory lectures, uh, we want to present some of the education materials um, that we're working on and or the fuse that is working on. And so this presentation will give you a bit of an overview of what we're creating and uh, get, show you a selection of the materials as well. Um, I know there's a lot of teachers from um, many countries, uh, some here live and also some uh, quite a lot of people will be catching up on this in the video. So hello to, to you if that's the case. And um, so um, the, the goal of today is to, of the teacher day, is to show the benefits of talking about fusion in secondary school. And, um, and so we want to provide teachers with everything they need um, for that. Um, so the first question is, um, I think this has largely been answered by Howard and Anika, is why should you talk about fusion in the classroom? And, and why now? Well, um, several reasons. Fusion is a very interesting topic um, to address in secondary school. It, it's multidisciplinary, um, combining physics, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering. It has complex challenges and it's a very promising area, an exciting area of research. Um, and it relates to a lot, as you've seen in the, the last talks, it relates to a lot of topics addressed in secondary school curricula. Um, so for example, as you can see in the slide, several ideas, atomic physics, electricity, magnetism, energy lasers, um, EM waves, um, and many more things, the energy, energy resources, uh, astrophysics. So, so there's so many things. And, and so there are so many practical applications of these kind of fundamental secondary physics processes, secondary school physics processes um, that can be taught through fusion as a theme. And this really makes it, uh, is one way as we all know to make it clearer and more real and less abstract. Um, and as uh, mentioned by, uh, by Howard earlier, um, you know, enthusiasm, and you all know as teachers, enthusiasm for science and engineering starts at secondary schools. Uh, you know, it's where students are in introduced to natural science. And, um, and yet yeah, students don't get interested in science uh, in these formative years, then the chances are pretty slim that they will ever be interested in science. Uh, anyhow, you all teachers do a fantastic job at inspiring students in science. And, um, and you, you show them awesome things. And fusion is one of those. And, um, and hopefully, um, you know, that the stereotype of a scientist is of course, some, you know, a very smart man or woman who seems to have always known everything. Um, but in reality, uh, every scientist starts out as a curious young person who wants to discover new stuff. And, um, you know, anyone can aspire to become a scientist through hard work and, and curiosity. Um, thirdly, um, as students at school, we, we learn all the basics of science, but a lot of the sort of cutting edge science stuff is, is just too difficult or complex to, to, to truly be understood by, by most students. And uh, you know, it's high, high level of abstraction may, may, is needed. Um, you know, for example, like difficult quantum physics uh, uh, is difficult to explain and that can be a barrier. Um, with fusion, even though it's a very complex subject, it is a very visible um, science in, in the sense that fusion reactors, um, you know, they are real things which have many different shapes and sizes and, and fusion plasmas are, uh, they're not just invisible plasmas, but they're, they're sort of visible bodies of, of light and matter. Uh, so in this session, um, that's the why, sort of why are we doing this, but the, uh, now that why is out of the way, this is sort of what we want to talk about. We want to show you a bit of an overview of the materials that we're currently working on um, and, and how these are going to be structured for the, for the classroom. 
Um, they're in their first draft stage, so we'll show you a bit of a selection of some of the sample draft material. Um, and we'll show you some sort of interesting links as well, which we think could be useful uh, for teachers and educators to know about. Um, it's basically our goal to provide ready to use fusion lessons for the classroom. And, and the idea is that this is in the form of five fusion learning modules. The quality is really important to FuseNet and um, the materials aren't fully finished yet as, uh, you, as I've said it, they're in the first draft. Uh, part of the reason for that is that this means we can incorporate your feedback um, after the, this teacher day um, so that we can make sure they're going to be as useful as possible. Uh, it's obviously quite a challenge to produce materials relevant for the whole of Europe <laughs> secondary school curricula uh, but of course there are so many physics themes that are that are the same I mean the fundamental physics is the same uh, at that level um, so after this event when the materials are finished they're, they're also going to be translated um, and uh, for use throughout the whole of Europe um, so um, to summarize we're, we're going to sort of show you an overview of the materials and then we're going to um, in the near future distribute freely this material um, and we'll let you know when, that, when that's ready. Um, so, as I've said, we've chosen to create this material in five separate modules, and each chapter can be independently treated, um, and they could be combined. And the idea is that each of the chapters will sort of serve as a basis for a, a one-hour lesson. Um, so the first chapter is the Fusion Basics, uh, and so this might be the only chapter uh, a, a teacher would, would use um, if they only have to touch on fusion. Um, so this covers why is fusion relevant, nu uh, nuclear reactions, um, and uh, you know, what happens when a charged particle enters the magnetic field, uh, what a plasma is. Uh, so depending on the level of the student and what top topics they've done, this could be a kind of review with fusion as a theme or it could be used to actually teach those topics as well uh, to give to give students that information. Chapter two is um, is a history of fusion, explaining the development of fusion. Um, so going from fusion in the stars, uh, it's obviously relevant to, in some uh, 14 to 16 curricula so in the UK uh, uh, have, have a little bit of an emphasis on that. Uh, few to fusion uh, through to fusion reactors on the Earth, right up to ITER that you've heard uh, about from Howard and Anika. Um, chapter three, fusion technologies. So this gives an overview of a typical device such as ITER um, and its parts, focusing on the different technologies that play a role in fusion. Uh, so vacuum technology, heating and cooling systems, um, superconducting magnets. Um, chapter four is about materials um, and uh, so, as you've heard from Anika, um, there's very, very intense um, heat loads. Uh, I can't remember now, was it several megawatts per meter squared uh, or uh, thousands of megawatts, I think, per meter squared, amazing, which materials have to withstand. Um, and so, so lots of interesting uh, aspects there. And, um, and then chapter five is the sort of energy context. Um, this is obviously a big, at the moment, a very, very important, crucial thing. Uh, you know, where does our energy come from now? What does this mean for the, what does fusion um, potentially, how could that fit in in the future? What role has fusion got in our energy use of the future? So the, the idea is that this modular approach um, allows teachers and educators to choose what fits your needs and time. Um, so for example, if the regular, if, you're, if you have to uh, deliver a section on heat conduction, um, then that, that could easily be plucked out, so there could be the, um, materials plucked out of the section on materials and, um, and the extreme heat conditions, etc., to enable you to, to teach that. Or if you're teaching energy, your units, electron volts uh, and so on, then um, that's easily connected to chapter five and, and you'd find materials there suitable to teach that. Um, and, and finally, if you want to give, you know, a whole um, multiple workshop of lessons or series of lessons then there, there are suggestions on uh, how that can be done um, work through you know for sort of full day or, or a kind of series um, so a bit more about material um, so each chapter chapter will have uh, specified learning goals or objectives um, obviously 
um, to, so that um, the student and the teacher knows what that lesson is about, what the student needs to take away. Um, so for example, in the Fusion Basics uh, chapter, um, there's those are the objectives, uh, which, um, yes, which you'll recognize, uh, certainly as a secondary teacher myself, I would recognize that uh, the first two of those certainly um, would, be, would be in post 14 and, and, uh, and, and definitely in post 16. And then the third one would come into post 16 and, and the last one. Uh, and what a plasma is, is a, 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 a sort of indirect, a bit slightly more indirectly. So, um, so uh, uh, what I meant earlier by uh, being able to use stuff from the, the module to teach things that you have to teach anyways as physicists and, and there's a connection with, with a connection to fusion. Um, so each of those chapters, so that those five modules that uh, I've told you about, each one is going to have the following. It's going to have a teacher's manual with instructions um, of how to use the chapter. And um, so it's a guide, guide for the teacher, um, a, present, a presentation um, and a student reader, uh, which was kind of like a, a short textbook and assignments. And, um, and so the, the student reader there, just to sort of clarify what that is, um, there's uh, expected to be about 10 pages maximum in each chapter. And then that will have the objectives and some text and illustrations outlining the physics um, and problems. Um, so um, further reading. So in total with five modules, that's, that makes a kind of little sort of textbook of about sort of 50 pages or so. Uh, that the teacher has available to use, or, or all of or parts of. Uh, to talk a bit more about the teacher manual, so what, what the teacher will have available to, for the resources, um, uh, 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 information about the, the objectives, but also the, the important concepts um, that are in the chapter and closely related physics topics which overlap. Um, there's also going to be some uh, purpose-made lesson plans um, and um, I think the plan is that there'll be a, a sort of short introductory 15 to 30 minute lesson and a more in-depth one hour lesson for each unit. Um, and of course, there's the possibility of just picking out bits and pieces from those to use in, in other areas uh, there. Um, interesting links. Um, so obviously there's lots of resources out there already made, so links to those and um, the solutions. Um, and just as an example of what, what I was meaning there by the, the closely related topics, um, for example, Fusion Basics, uh, which is that first sort of module. I mean, there are, there are really uh, key links to secondary curricula, uh, atomic physics, electricity, magnetism, ideal gases, uh, and so on. So uh, there would be that some information um, sort of indicating what, where, where these links were. Um, in terms of the presentation material, um, there will be slides produced for each of the of each of the topics, as usual. Um, presentation, so it's visual storytelling. You know, we all know the benefits of of PowerPoint, um, and um, we're hoping to provide some really good uh, quality presentations um, when the, when those are completed. Um, and very importantly, um, these are free resources. So these are basically free for teachers to, to use, um, have and use and uh, in any way they like and adapt. Um, there. Um, so uh, just a few examples um, uh, here of some sort of slides that have already, uh, sort of draft slides that are already being produced um, to sort of get an idea. Oh, these are from the, the chapter three. So chapter three on fusion technologies. Um, I mean, there's a few topics there. Um, so, for example, yeah, I think Howard mentioned about the a, a classic A-level physics effect that used in in ITER is a sort of transformer effect, and um, and, and I mean, it, you, I mean, and to a lesser degree, I mean, transformers in in GCSE in the UK, so 14, 16 as well. Uh, so it's really sort of classic physics, and amazing that that is, uh, you know, that, that effectively. The, this effect where the plasma is kind of like a single secondary coil. Um, although I think in the E to one, how to the, the, uh, the 
primary coil is kind of in the middle, um, but it's the same transformer effect. Uh, so a lovely, a lovely link there uh, between um, to, to the secondary curriculum. Um, I squared R heating. So the, the current um, in a plasma has a heating effect, but plasma has to get really, really hot. So I squared R, everyone will recognize as, you know, in, in 14 to 16, 16 to 18, very important. Um, so it's a lovely application of that. And then a little bit sort of beyond that, um, interesting, I think quite interestingly, as, as the temperature goes up, the resistance of the plasma goes down, which uh, obviously is a bit of a problem for heating. So there has to be other um, methods. One of those is using EM waves. Um, and so there's a nice analogy there um, between microwave cooking, which of course all students would know about, and um, the sort of the, when the micros have a resonance effect with the oscillating the water molecules. And so there's a sort of an analogy, I think it looks like radio frequency um, being used to heat a plasma. And um, so that's kind of an analogous resonance effect with the electrons and the, and the ions there to, to cause heating. Uh, another heating effect, so there's lots of heating here, um, um, neutral beam injector, injection. So one way of heating a plasma is just to fire loads of particles. So uh, great physics concepts, uh, particle collisions, um, interesting questions in, in the classroom, you know, the fact that neutral particles can go straight through the plasma unaffected by the magnetic fields, uh, which is in, you know, in the, you know, uh, uh, all in the 14, 16, that needs that are definitely aidable. And then, and then the question of, well, if you have to get these far, so they're going to transfer their energy to plasma particles, but how do you, how do you uh, accelerate these neutral particles? Um, and there's, uh, well, there's another slide here with a bit more depth there this time about, uh, so I think you have to sort of ionize them and then accelerate them because you can only accelerate a charged particle and then then neutralize them before you inject them. So it's all very complicated. So that, that obviously takes it a bit deeper. Um, yes, uh, uh, well, you've seen those perspective slides from uh, Howard and Nika about ETA. And so in there, that plasma chamber ha has to be in a vacuum vessel. So it's a, a nice opportunity there to talk about um, density, pressure, uh, gas laws, um, uh, yeah, and you, that, as and you can now show you, actually, the huge dimensions of uh, this thing. Um, the cryostatic eater. Um, so, well, this, the vacuum vessel will be, um, will be inside this. And as Anika mentioned, that the, these, the super, the coils which have to produce the magnetic fields have to be um, so, yes, that was amazing what Anika said about the, uh, the range. I hadn't realized that the range of temperatures going from zero Kelvin or almost zero Kelvin in the liquid or four Kelvin in the liquid hydrogen to uh, 10 to the 8 Kelvin, amazing, uh, in a very short number of meters. Um, so lots of lovely discussions there, the Kelvin temperature scale, absolute zero, all that sort of thing. So uh, there's there um, a slide that uh, takes that, uh, uh, takes things a little bit further there, um, making measurements on the plasma, um, uh, various techniques, techniques there. Um, so, uh, and so a few examples of materials there. The student reader, uh, so this is the kind of uh, the textbook that I, I mentioned that's going to be put together or is being put together. Um, so this, this, will, uh, this will have um, some explanatory text and illustrations as I mentioned and some sort of interesting links. So here's an example. Um, there'd be the sort of learning objectives, the discussion on the energy problem, then the physics bits there, um, all linking to the curriculum and uh, further, further reading. Um, assignments, um, of course, we know, we all know that as teachers and learners that uh, reading is one thing, but it's do it applying the knowledge that uh, makes the difference for students. So, um, so each chapter will have multiple assignments um, leveled and uh, easier questions to hard questions um, and the solutions of course in the teacher's manual there. Good. Oh and there's an example um, from one of the chapters so a sort of fusion uh, okay so if you're teaching 
A level physics in the UK or post 16 IB physics somewhere, or you'll recognize that as a sort of classic type of question, um, E equals MC squared question in relating to fusion there. Um, mentioned earlier about the idea of links. Uh, these materials by FuseNet um, are going to be available, but of course there's loads of stuff which actually already exists and has been made, which is brilliant. And, and as teachers, it's sometimes very difficult. Well, we sort of come across these things and we use them, um, but sometimes it's nice when, they're, uh, when someone can point out these great links. So we're intending to do that. Um, so for example, there's just an example list there. Uh, this, so there's some kind of fusion game, um, which I'll try and uh, hopefully drag onto the screen. Oh yes, this, uh, so um, this is some kind of game where you sort of have to fuse your way to iron. It looks, it looks like it should be really easy, but I haven't, I've totally been failed. It's actually more difficult than it looks. It, 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 uh, you, ha you only have a limited amount of hydrogen. And, and if you don't think about the reactions, then you run out of time, you run out of hydrogen. And you can see the reactions. So there's actually quite a lot to that. I've tried a few times, haven't actually been able to do it uh, there. Um, there's, um, and then for example, a, a little uh, good, good video, good video that's available. Um, have I managed to start that video? Try again. Ah, oh, well, I, I don't think I've, I don't think it's, it's going to start, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, so that, that's uh, another, um, uh, just a, 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 a cool video, you know, which is one of those that you want to use in a lesson to, um, that's perfect as a kind of introduction to fusion. And there's other stuff, you know, lesson plans, um, some app uh, and so on. So hopefully uh, when, when you go into the teacher resources, um, those links will be a really useful thing that you can just draw on and, and, and use. Um, where is all this stuff going to be? You are probably wondering. And the answer is that on the FuseNet website, it's not there yet, but there's a, a repository for educational material. And um, so this is going to be added. The, the, within the coming months, the class, all this classroom material is going to be added there. Um, you will get an email about that um, and um, it's going to be translated so uh, I, I, I don't know exactly which languages but um, hopefully um, all European languages at least and, um, and as I said before freely available uh, for, for use. Um, oh yes there's there is a video being produced by Fuse there a really good 10 minute uh, video um, but there was we were hoping to have a little snippet but it's still being it's still still in the final sort of editing stages, I think. But um, so that's something to look out for. Um, and something else to look out for is this uh, ETA model, which is apparently printable if you have a 3D printer in your school or college. Or, um, so it sounds so that's actually an ETA thing. So you can actually make a 3D model of the ETA passage, which is brilliant. Uh, health warning: I think someone told me it takes a long time. I haven't ever done 3D printing, but it probably takes quite a long time to print, but uh, fantastic. And um, so that's the end, really. Um, just to sort of summary, I mean, um, hopefully, you know, we, we've given you a bit of an idea there of what to expect um, here. And, um, you know, we're, we're working hard to, to sort of produce this ready to use stuff, which is going to be helpful for you. Um, what there's one thing left to say, really, and that's that. Um, you know, we, we'd really like your feedback. Um, very important to us to, to develop these resources in the best way that's useful for teachers uh, to help to educate young people. Uh, and um, we hope you feel inspired to bring fusion into uh, or more into secondary schools and to sort of grow the international fusion community. Uh, so thanks very much. And um, yes, please do uh, uh, if you have any specific questions on it, I think there's a break coming up pretty soon now, but, but if you have, I'm not sure what the time is, or, uh, but if you do have any questions on specifically on the education material, uh, please feel free to, and I'll do my best to, to answer. Thank you.
Thank you. Okay, so yeah, the, um, the webinar thing starts at um, approximately 35 minutes past or half past, I think. So there's a break scheduled from quarter past until then. But um, Nick isn't going to be in the Q&A session, like I said earlier. So if you do have any questions for him, you can use the time now before the webinar starts. If not, you can go on a slightly early break. Uh, one good thing that, yes, Rod has mentioned in the chat there that, uh, yeah, Prime, I mean, I've been going on and on about secondary education. And um, so um, hopefully, uh, yes, I mean, hopefully FuseNet will uh, target materials for, for below secondary and primary. So very, very important as well. Yes, sorry, by the way, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to, am I allowed to just jump in, Lucy, is that allowed? Um, yeah, um, just, just say, Nick, sorry, I wasn't, I wasn't, certainly wasn't trying to be critical of, of what you were saying, um, but but um, but um, I knew, I certainly knew you weren't, weren't being exclusive there, but um, uh, yeah, j just in case we, <clears throat> we have any people who are interested in, in primary education, obviously one can't, it's not appropriate to teach technical stuff to primary schools, um, but there is some activity, um, uh, in um, in primary, so for example, we have some PhD students who've gone into local schools and done um, had uh, groups of students in 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 school halls um, pretending to be electrons or ions, and the electrons all move around really quickly, and the ions move a bit slower, and they bump into each other, and but it's all a bit chaotic, um, just like a plasma. But it's that's kind of a bit of fun. Um, and one of the things that Fusion is looking at, and any feedback on this idea would be interesting. Um, would be to enable um, uh, youngsters in primary schools to be able to have contact with a real fusion scientist. So there's a there's a writer postcard to a scientist. Uh, it's not a new idea that, that some other areas have been working in this. Uh, some, some other areas of science have tried this before with with some pretty decent success. Um, and so this is an idea that we're looking at. Um, one of one of my colleagues is is looking at over the coming year. So any feedback on on that idea for? Uh, for younger pupils would, would also be um, uh, valued. Um, but th thank you, Nick, for that. That was, all, that was all really interesting, so thank you. There's a question come up in the chat there, if you want to look at that, Nick. Oh, I think it's been sent to me. Sorry, oh, I'll read it. This is fine someone just saying that it's um, a very useful uh, set of resources um, for interested students at A-level, but uh, for lower schools it might be useful to have, um, sorry, just trying to read it all, useful for small pieces to be split out into like five minute segments rather than long lessons. Um, is that, so I, it wasn't in the presentation, but I remembered someone saying that there was the idea of having either long kind of hour lessons or maybe short 15 minute um activities is that something you know anything about yes i've seen that there's a uh, there is an idea to well the, the first thing to say is that i think fuse is very very keen to to give teachers what they want and need so that's really good feedback and uh, yeah there is definitely thinking i mean i know yeah my thought was very focused on sort of the sort of uh secondary type stuff but um, where, where there might be sort of quite a long segments of lessons and so on. But yes, no, there's definitely thinking going on that, that, um, that there should be materials appropriate, you know, for what teachers want. So definitely really good feedback. And um, I think that is in, definitely in people's minds to have short sort of chunks and, and snippets which are going to be useful and, and materials and resources which can just be, uh, that, that, you know, that are bite-sized and that are suitable in the primary. So I don't know exactly how that's going to work, but, uh, but yes, uh, that's definitely something that uh, there is discussion about. And yeah, another question in the chat, I think that you can see, does the classroom item contain social content on Fusion as well as scientific content? Uh, yes, I think, I think there is discussion in the first lesson, especially about uh, there will be uh, about the um, 
the energy uh, that the require and especially in the last on the energy context I, I think there'll be a fairly significant sort of section on that yeah I don't know the details about them but I, I am sure that those will be there yeah that's a good question thank you If no one else has any questions then, uh, we'll, I suppose, end this meeting so you can all have a, a short break before the webinar starts. But then uh, we will be back here um, after the webinar for a question and answer session if anyone has any questions that they think of um, between now and then. Okay. Thank you.